On Sundays at the Yoido Full Gospel Church in Seoul, arrive late and find standing room only. Among the thousands listening this morning is this small group. Not so long ago, the people in this row would have been national heroes. Today, they're just anonymous faces in the crowd. Yet each of them has performed their own miracle, risking their lives and those of their families to escape the most isolated, repressive society in the world. After the main mass, the group gathers for a private service at the North Korean mission. This is one of the few places defectors meet in a group, and a rare chance for us to meet them without being shadowed by South Korean security police. Our attempts to make contact with defectors have been constantly monitored, at times barred. The South Korean government wants the world to see nothing but the success stories. Church groups like this provide the precious little community support available for defectors when they arrive. Even here, though, they're being asked to take a leap of faith many are not willing to make. At 20 years of age, Kim Hyung Duck left behind his entire family to cross the North Korean border into China on foot. When he crossed over, he weighed just 29 kilograms. Well, Kim found the freedom he wanted in the South, but also found himself an outcast, isolated and bewildered. This morning, he doesn't hide his disappointment. Kim arrived in the South three years ago, bringing little more than a family snapshot of two sisters he left behind, and more scars than his years deserve, a legacy of torture at the hands of North Korean security police. In the South, he found people indifferent to him. He found it impossible to adjust. He says he was ill-equipped for this dog-eat-dog -dog world of capitalist, money-hungry and fiercely competitive South Korea. In the North, everything is so tightly controlled, all decisions are made by the government. Housing, education, food rationing, even social status. Finally, he became so disenchanted with the South, Kim Hyung Duck tried going back. <laughs> Last year he was caught at this South Korean port of Ulsan, stowed away on a cargo ship bound for China. Out of prison, he's now trying to fit in, but still doubts whether South Korea wants him. It hasn't always been so. After the bloody Korean War ended, South Korea welcomed defectors from the North. They were political trophies, fated as heroes.
As the economic and political situation worsens in the north, South Korea can only expect the number of refugees to grow, and with it, the bill for resettling them in the south. It's hard to believe that South Korea, like North Korea, lay devastated after the Korean War. 44 years on, and they've crafted their own economic miracle. While on the other hand, the North's economy is a shambles. South Koreans now look around at what they've got and ask themselves, should we have to pay for North Korea's economic disaster? Academically, we are preparing the, so many measures to help North Korean people. But as a matter of fact, most of the South Korean people have mixed feelings about North Korea, kind of love and hatred toward North Korean people. Dr. Lee Kum Sun is helping devise the South Korean government's response for a massive influx of refugees. Everybody talks about the national unification. Unification is our assignment. They, they are saying the kind of word, but as a matter of fact, no one wants to sacrifice their immediate interest. It's extremely rare to find someone who risks being so outspoken on such a sensitive issue. Even the government don't want national unification. At the moment. They are using the unification issues for their political interest. But it's true. The South Korean government wants unification on its own terms and cracks down on unauthorised attempts to hurry the process. Here, members of the North Korean Buddhist movement are offering 100 days of prayer for the dying and famine struck in North Korea. Nearby in the temple grounds, student radicals stage a hunger strike and sit in. Their cause, unification with the North and the right to protest. They're exercising that right today under threat of arrest by security police. Mr Park from the North Korean Buddhist movement has offered to help us find other defectors. Is it very far to the house? No. He won't give us the address over the telephone, but he will take us there. We need a third party to get around the tight security net that guards defectors. This security serves a dual purpose. It helps the government keep a lid on defectors' activities and it protects them. One well-known defector was murdered outside his apartment earlier this year and police suspect North Korean agents of the killing. In a small city apartment, I meet Lee Chul Su and his wife Cho Sung Hee. They came here in 1993 with their young daughter Jin Shil after escaping via China. Mrs Cho works, but her husband is still debilitated by the effects of frostbite suffered during many months of sleeping on streets and scavenging for food in China. They enjoy luxuries undreamt of in the north. Fresh fruit and vegetables daily, meat on a regular basis. But it's far from a lavish lifestyle. <laughs> Yet they're subject to deeply held suspicion and resented for the government assistance they're given.
또뭐 북한에서 왔다 하게 되면 조금 이 경시하는 태도 그러니 그 사람이 좀뭐 그 눈치만 네. 봐도 알잖아요 좀 생각을 많이 하면서 여기서 실질적으로 이렇게 말하고 이제 티브랑 나가지 않습니까 그게 되면 그거 다 거짓말로 좀 이렇게 꾸며서 나가지 않나 이런 걸로 인식하는 사람들이 많더라고요. 아. 아이고. Most of the money they were given was spent leasing this small apartment. Now the government is cutting back on money to newcomers. Before 1993, government gave them about three times more of financial assistance to the school and defectors. 지금 오히려 자 어, 과거에 보다도 정부의 지원 정책이 보다 실질적인 그 화됐다. 실제 실제 화됐다. 자기들한테 혜택이 더 많이 돌아올 것이다라고 지금 인식하고 있는 걸로 알고 있습니다. 그래서 아까 말씀드린 그런 그 지원액의 그 액수의 규모가 적어졌다. 뭐 그런 개념보다도. It was nine years ago, while studying in Moscow, that a North Korean physics student called Kim Young Se. Learned the truth about life in the affluent South. 거기 우이타에서 살기를 원하고 지금까지 지내왔었는데 실제 우이 있는 사람들은 그것이 아니었다고 하는 것. 그들은 일반 백성들을 그렇게 속여 가지고 자기들의 그 권리만을 누리고 있고 그럴 때 이제 북한 사회는 바뀌어야 된다고 하는 그런 마음을 독도 갖게 되었었습니다. In 1992, he was the subject of a dramatic tug of war between the Russian and North Korean governments after seeking asylum in Moscow. Well educated, he was better received in South Korea than most defectors. Yet he carries a burden that weighs more heavily than mere discrimination. Last year, Kim married his South Korean wife. And they now have a one-month-old son, but he left another wife, another infant son, in North Korea. So, if you are going to have a child, you have to give it to your wife. And you have to give it to your wife. So, you have to give it to your wife. So, you have to give it to your wife. So, you have to give it to your wife. So, you have to give it to your wife. So, you have to give it to your wife. So, you have to give it to your wife. 그 처형을 알고서도 이길 갈수 있다고 하는 그 마음에는 당신들이 어느 정도 이해하면은 우리들이 갖고 있는 그 고통이라고 하는 것을 좀알수 있지 않겠냐? The North Korean government has forcibly divorced Kim from his wife in North Korea, and he knows she too has remarried. But the guilt of leaving family behind has driven defectors here to depression, alcoholism, even suicide. The feeling of isolation in such a crowded, busy city is tangible. There's no counselling available and little sympathy. Everywhere, the catch cry is one Korea. Today, in the heart of the city, religious groups have gathered on this national holiday to pray for peaceful unification. But they're a noisy minority, far outweighed by the surrounding indifference. It's fine to talk of grand notions of peace and unification, harder to make it work if you can't live with your neighbour or don't want to pay for his house. The South Korean government is providing more practical support, giving defectors job training, building settlement centres for new arrivals. But what it has yet to build 
is a bridge to span 50 years of division and hostility.